After being profiled on shows like Forensic Files, 2020, and 48 Hours, I decided to look into this case for our next installment of It's Getting Real. Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Tisha here and we are back to discuss a case that really got me upset as well as got me thinking. Go ahead and hit that like button and be prepared to tell me what you think about this case in the comment section. So Donna Brown was the oldest of three girls born in Hollywood, Florida on November 10th, 1963. She was extremely close to both of her parents and was described as a delightful child, magnetic, extremely kind, loving and outgoing, making everyone instantly comfortable when they were around her. She naturally was happy and as a result, she loved making others happy as well. Knowing this, it just goes to show you the type of person that she was. Being the oldest child, she set a great example for her siblings, which happened to be two younger sisters. She was Jewish and her family unit meant a lot to her. So much so that she couldn't wait until she was old enough to be married and to have children as well as her own family. Despite coming from a loving family, however, her parents, Sarah and Robert, got divorced when she was 17, which of course, like how it would be on a lot of kids, it was hard on her, especially at 17, because you really understand what's going on and you got an opportunity to see your parents be together. But despite that separation, the family did remain close. Her mother, Sarah Jane, later married a man by the name of Ira. And at some point when Donna was 24, she began working as a technician in an operating room. That age kind of varies, but the point is she was working in the operating room. One of her coworkers by the name of Greg Winger was talking to Donna about his brother. His brother's name was Mark and Mark had just returned from serving a year in Korea as a lieutenant. Sounds admirable. Who doesn't, you know, want to deal with, you know, a military person who doesn't gain respect for someone who holds, you know, that type of honor, who's willing to fight for our country. And of course, she found this to be intriguing. So Greg suggested that they meet each other. After all, his brother was Jewish. His brother was smart, handsome had a great sense of humor, was successful, and above all else, he wanted a family, which matched what she wanted. Now, they describe his as handsome. Y'all can look at the thumbnail and tell me what you guys think, because I don't see what the big draw was to him, but apparently he had a pull on the young ladies and some very attractive women liked him. So she went on this blind date, this blind date, they had a great time and they became an item. This is where her and Mark hit it off. So Mark Allen Winger was the youngest of three children. He had an older brother and an older sister. So that alone shows you, okay, yes, she was the oldest, but she came from a family with three children, as did he. So they had things that they were connecting on. Mark was ambitious, earning a bachelor's degree in physics from Virginia Military Institute. His desire was to become a nuclear engineer. And by the time he met Donna, he was working as a physicist for a laboratory. As I said earlier, earlier, they hit it off instantly on their blind date. Mark was quiet and he was reserved, but he was funny. And that made Donna like him more. Donna's family also instantly liked him, probably because they seemed happy together. They were always close together, either holding hands or touching in some loving way. And they seemed to balance each other out, making them seem like they were a great match. So in June of 1986, after six months of dating, Mark proposed to Donna. She said yes. Now you guys know, those of you who have watched me before, y'all know that I'm skeptical about quick engagements. Engagements. I do feel like they can and have worked though, because I know some people who have had very successful relationships 
who were dating for a short time. Some people will say when you know, you know, but I feel like sometimes there are people who you really don't know them. That honeymoon phase lasts for whatever duration it does. And some people are just giving you, you know, one aspect of their self. They're not allowing you to see all their layers. And I think that in watching this and listening to this, it's clear that Mark had many layers. So on March 4th, 1989, the two got married. They moved to Springfield, Illinois because Mark got a great job opportunity there. And Donna also got a job um, assisting a plastic surgeon at a Memorial Medical Center in Springfield. They moved into a great neighborhood with great interactions and their goal was to start their new family. So here they are, right? They're married, they're happy, they have great careers, but they are missing one thing. As the years go by, they're missing a child. For six years, Donna and Mark tried to conceive because as I stated before, they both wanted kids. And at some point, because of all of the years of trying and after all of the attempts, Donna received the devastating news that she was able to have kids. I'm not sure how she knew that, what testing that she had done, if it was an assumption, but either way, she found out she couldn't have kids. This had to be rough for her, especially because this is clearly something that she always wanted. It was also tough for her husband, I'm sure, because he too dreamed of having a large family. And I think that a lot of times we take for granted that it's not always easy to, to you know, have babies. You just don't know what the situation is unless you are to have certain tests done or you are to see what your fertility looks like and things of that nature so their baby struggles caused them to have some rifts within their relationship but it wasn't anything too major and donna felt like over time they would be okay and they could overcome it because donna was willing to expand her family, she was willing to do so in any way that she could, even if that meant that she couldn't have a child naturally. So she thought of adoption. One day while Donna was at work, one of the doctors let her know that they had a teenage mother who was going to give her baby up for adoption. So the doctor asked if anyone knew well, anyone in the room knew of anyone who was willing to adopt a baby. Of course, this had to seem like it was meant to be because what are the odds of a baby being brought into your life this easily through adoption? Trust me, I have an aunt and uncle who went through the process and it takes an extremely long time, years for some people in order to be matched. So the fact that here she is after six years, finally deciding, you know what, maybe we can adopt and then not too long later, this idea is, is you know, brought up like, I have somebody that needs a home. Are you willing? So on June 1st, 1995, Mark and Donna adopted a beautiful baby girl into their family and they named her Bailey Elizabeth Winger. There are some home videos of when she first came home and when Bailey comes home, you see how happy Donna is and you hear her saying, I'm overwhelmed and I just want her to know that this just so happens to also be the anniversary of our engagement, our engagement, which shows how special her addition to our family it is. So of course, if this is not only you've adopted this baby and this baby is coming home, but this is also the same day that you got engaged. Of course, you have a lot of a lot of happy, you know, feelings because here we are. We got engaged in June and now we you know we're getting a baby in June. It's significant. Um, she says, I'm overwhelmed and I just want her to know how happy I am. So it seems like everything in that moment was perfect. Bailey brought so much joy to their little family. That's the, what they decided to name the baby. Donna said that she knew the moment that the baby was placed into her arms, that she was hers and she was meant to be. Their bond was instant and it was unmistakable. Her sister said that becoming a mother was probably the best thing that ever happened in Donna's life. And just looking at the videos, you can see that it meant a lot to Donna. I was watching and I was like, man, the fact that this woman finally got what she wanted 
and finally was able to have a baby of her own and was willing to show this baby so much love. I'm glad that she got to experience it. I'm sad that it was for such a short time. So Bailey was instantly bonded to not just Donna, but to Mark, of course, and also to her family. They even had a traditional Jewish naming ceremony for Bailey as family and friends were there to show their love and support for her. One friend in particular, Deanne Schultz, remember this name because she's going to come back into play as I continue to tell this story. She had became very close with Donna. She was uh, a close friend from work. She helped Donna learn the ropes of being a new mom. I can't speak for everyone else, but in those beginning stages when you first have a child, that learning curve is, you, you learn a lot to the point where sometimes you second guess yourself or you question things, is this cry I need a bottle or is, or is this cry I need a change? So I'm sure that the additional support that she got from Donna made her feel really good. Of course she had the support of Mark as well, but Donna having Deanna, Deanne's support made her feel good, okay? So Deanne supported her in whatever way she could with whatever um, Donna needed. She was all hands in and Donna referred to her and she referred to herself as Bailey's aunt. Just goes to show you how close they were. Um, Deanne and her husband, John, would often spend time and go out with Donna and Mark. Mark and Donna both loved being parents and they both enjoyed spending time with that other couple. When Bailey was three months old, Donna decided to take Bailey for a visit to go visit Donna's family in Florida. They were gone for a week. Mark was away on business and her mother knew like it's a lot to try to get back from the airport and then get in a car and then drive for a certain amount of time to get home. So her mother decided to go ahead and order a shuttle to pick her up from the airport. That way, Donna wouldn't have to worry about anything. She could just focus on Bailey during the long ride. During the almost two-hour ride home, Donna's driver, 27-year-old Roger Harrington, who had been working for this transport company for about six months, made Donna uneasy with the type of conversations that he wanted to have. Not only was he allegedly speeding, but he also spoke about killing people and using drugs and having orgies, which all made Donna feel extremely uncomfortable. So when Donna got home, she did what anyone else would do. She called her mother, she called her sister and told them about the weird experience that she had. Then she decided to call Mark because Mark was away on business. She wanted to let him know what happened. So he suggests, you know, to, to Donna to write down exactly what happened, including every detail of what the driver said. At some point, um, they notified Roger's employer and he was suspended. The days following the encounter, according to Roger, they supposedly received strange calls, strange calls at their home. The caller would breathe and then hang up. So Mark was convinced that this caller who was calling and breathing and hanging up and not saying anything and not threatening them or anything else, just breathing and hanging up, was the driver. So I guess in his eyes, the driver had nothing better to do than harass them. I don't know how he got their phone number or any of that stuff, but apparently this is what the driver did. So Mark filed a complaint with the shuttle van company, um, BART Transport, claiming that the driver was harassing them. The company, as I said, suspended the driver. Um, and you would think that this would be the end of it, but it wasn't. So it's Tuesday afternoon, August 29th, 1995. Six days after the situation happened with Donna and the driver, Mark was working out in the basement and he was on the treadmill when he says that he heard a loud bump or a crash. So he did what any normal person would do. He was worried that Donna had either fallen or dropped the baby. So he runs upstairs to the master bedroom. Now, I personally would run to the sound, but he ran to the master bedroom. He finds Bailey laying on the bed and he's like okay my wife would not leave my three-month-old on the bed but he also while assessing her is on the bed he hears screams from another area in the house so because he hears these screams he grabs his gun rushes out 
in the hallway. I'm a little confused because I don't understand how this setup, the house is set up and why he, you know, automatically thought to grab a gun, but that's what he thought. So he runs in and he finds his 31 year old wife, Donna, on the floor with a man striking her in the head repeatedly with a hammer. This alone sounded fishy to me because I don't get why or how this man even got in the house, but we're just going to go with it, okay? So Mark aims the gun at the, at the intruder, shoots him. You hear him in the emergency call. He's out of breath. Help me. I just shot this man in my house. He, he beat my wife. His brains are everywhere. The man is on the floor. You hear the operator. She's asking him a whole bunch of questions. And one of them is, is he dead? Mark responds, I don't know. He's making weird sounds. If he's making weird sounds, then he's not dead. You hear Mark say, please, please, please. So the operator says, I need you to slow down. Is the man still in your house? He says, yes. He's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Please remember that statement. I said a bullet in his head, meaning it's one bullet, right? I shot him. He, he, he was killing my wife. My baby's crying. I got to go. And he hangs up the phone. I understand that his child is crying, but your wife may need assistance in this moment. Why are you hanging up the phone? The man who is attacking your wife, you just said is still making noises. What are we doing about this man? What are we doing about your wife? Is it really a good idea to focus on the baby who's just crying rather than what's going on with this man? So he says, I'll call you right back. As I said, he hangs up the phone. The operator ends up calling Mark back. He says, my wife is dying on the floor. He's asked, is she still alive? He says, I think, uh, I think, uh, I, it's okay though. The gun is on the table. I don't know who the guy is because the operator's like, do you know who he is? Da, 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 da. You gotta, gotta go. He's like, I don't know who he is. He's laying on the floor. I gotta hold my wife. I gotta get to my wife. I gotta hold my wife. Please let me hold my wife. I promise you I won't hang up. I just need to hold my wife. Probably he's, you know, if you're saying you're gonna go hold your wife, then you're gonna go hold your wife. Completely understandable. Maybe the phone doesn't stretch all the way over there. So go ahead and hold your wife. He confirms because the 911 operator is like, are you, is your, is your wife's name Donna? Are you Mark? And he's like, yes, that's us. Um, the man came in a few minutes ago. He says like, I need to get my wife. I need to get my wife. And he tells the operator that his door is open, right? So a police arrive, the police arrive on the scene and they find both Donna and Roger still had a weak pulse. Or let me not say Roger, because right now we don't know it's Roger. The man still had a weak pulse. Spoiler, sorry, I told you it was. Roger and, and, and Donna had a weak pulse. Mark was in the back bedroom, rocking back and forth in shock. Donna was face down on the dining room floor, covered in blood. Several feet away from the intruder and he was on his back and he was shot twice now y'all remember i told you he called the, the 911 operator and told them that there was a bullet a bullet so there's a gun there are bodies there's a lot of blood there's a hammer the hammer is covered in blood to me if the hammer is covered in blood then this sounds like there's something personal here. A lot of times anger and aggression result in what close body thing. They say that with knives and things of that nature. One of the first officers on the scene knew that both people would be rushed to the hospital for emergency treatment. So he did something that ended up later coming back to help this case. He ran out to his car, grabbed his Polaroid camera, snapped a few pictures of the crime scene and the victims. I think his name was Dave, if I remember correctly. Grabbed the, the, the camera, took some pictures. The ambulance arrives, takes both of the um, people to the hospital. Police then question Mark in the other room. He tells them what happened. He tells officers that 
the hammer that the intruder used to attack his wife with was left out as a reminder to hang a hat rack. Weird, but okay. He then tells them the same story that he told the 911 operator that he was working out on the treadmill in the basement. He heard a commotion. He found the body, the baby on the bed in the master bedroom. Then he heard Donna screaming. So he grabbed his gun, found the man beating Donna and he shot him. He said the man fell backward, landing on his back. But then he began to sit up facing him. So Mark shot him again. When he was on that 911 call, he never mentioned any of that, which automatically would make me feel like, okay, there's something not right about this situation because why was he so detailed with the 911 operator before and he didn't mention that, but here he is now telling us that he did it again. While he is going back over uh, events with um, Detective Charlie Cox, Mark is asked if he knows this person and Mark says no. And Mark is like, who is he? And the detective already unbeknownst to Mark had went and saw his wallet and saw exactly who he was and knew exactly who he was, but he did not tell Mark. He asked Mark, you know, to focus on telling them what happened. So Mark keeps asking who the intruder is and he's still not receiving an answer from the detectives. So he then says to the detectives, he says to Detective Charlie Cox, was his name Roger Harrington? At all people, that's who he guessed. So the detective says, yeah, that's his name. Mark says, Roger Harrington, oh my God, that's the guy that's been harassing us all week. He then explains that Roger was the driver that engaged in inappropriate conversation with his wife and that he had called Roger that very morning telling him to stop harassing his wife and that he had filed a police report or some type of report against him. What Detective Charlie didn't share with him at that time was that he knew who Roger was, which him thinking that he knew Roger did cause some issues and a lapse in judgment on his part in this case. Detective Cox owned part of a trailer park in town. Roger and his wife had rented a trailer from Detective Charlie Cox. And at some point, there was some type of domestic incident where Detective Charlie Cox got involved. So he considered 27-year-old Roger to be someone who was quick to anger and that would have angry fits based on what he saw at that trailer park. But there was more to the story than the detective ever considered. We'll get back to that more towards the bottom of this. So while being questioned, Mark asked detectives if he could have a Diet Coke. Weird request if you ask me, but I guess the man was thirsty. So the detective, the next one, his name was Doug Williamson, um, which was another one of the lead detectives. <coughs> that went down the wrong tube. Woo. He goes to the refrigerator, gets him the drink, and can't happen to notice this note that is on the refrigerator. <coughs> there was a note that Donna had written detailing what had happened with the driver almost a week ago. It matched verbatim what Mark had told them. Outside the home, they noticed Roger's car. It was parked on the wrong side of the street facing oncoming traffic. In it, they found a knife, a tire iron that had black electrical tape around the handle like you would grip it, and a note that had Mark's name, his address, and a time, 4.30, in the car. I don't know who randomly decides to write a note with the name and address and a time, and it's not considered to be something important. Not only that, why didn't he bring that tire iron or that knife in the home if he really planned on attacking Donna? So inside the house, they also found a yellow coffee mug and cigarettes on the kitchen table that both belonged to Roger. The detectives consoled Mark 
assuring him that he had done everything that he could to try to save his wife. But unfortunately, Donna didn't make it and neither did Roger. <clears throat> According to them, Mark was inconsolable. And as a result, he called his rabbi to come help, you know, comfort him. Mark was worried that he would be arrested for shooting the attacker, but the detectives said in their eyes that there was really no cause for concern. So he and his wife were victims of a horrible attack and Mark was considered a hero because he shot the attacker. Donna's death was then listed as a murder by Roger and Robert's death was listed as uh, Roger's death was listed as justifiable homicide due to self-defense. And the case was closed within 48 hours of the murder. Understand, in my opinion, that, well, that Mark being a wealthy Jewish man and Roger being a poor Caucasian man influenced this decision. Whether we like it or not, there is such a thing called implicit bias. And I very much so believe that that was a part of this case because there is no way why with the little bit of stuff that I've told you about the note and the discrepancy with the 911 call and what they saw and the fact that he brought cigarettes and a coffee mug in there and all these other things, that this case was not thoroughly investigated. And after 48 hours, they came to the conclusion that Roger who had a knife and a tire iron in the car, walked in that house with no weapon, but had time to bring some cigarettes in a cup and he wanted to kill someone. Make it make sense. So after the passing of Donna, Donna's family was immediately there to help with the transition for, uh, for Mark and Bailey. Her mom felt like she just couldn't understand why anybody would want to harm Donna because Donna was so loving and a lot of the family members felt that way. But Donna's mother and sister, while still grieving the loss of Donna, took turns traveling to Springfield to help Mark take care for the baby. We're talking about they took flights, they drove, they alternated things to make sure that they were there. During these visits, they noticed that Mark was behaving different, that he was drinking excessively, and he would watch movies that had really violent, like, in-your-face shooting scenes. Scenes that you would think that he would avoid after what had happened at his home. But they tried really hard not to judge Mark. They didn't want to. They decided that they were going to let him grieve in whatever way helped him best. And as far as they were concerned, they loved Mark. After all, he had been in their family for several years. And they wanted to make sure that they were there for him and Bailey. And as a result, you know, you just let certain things go. But after four months of traveling back and forth to help, Donna's mother said that they just got to the point where they couldn't continue to travel because all those flights add up. So Donna's mom recommended to Mark that he look into getting help by hiring a nanny. So he did. Her name was Rebecca. Rebecca, Rebecca was a beautiful, caring, sweet 23-year-old woman. Donna's mother and sister even liked her. They loved Rebecca and they loved how she cared for Bailey, which says a lot about Rebecca because I'm sure that it was hard to watch another woman care for her daughter's baby, but they could see that, you know, she was a good person and they embraced her being there to help. And, you know, the family appreciated Rebecca being a part of Bailey's life. Rebecca felt welcomed and supported by everyone from the family and all involved with the exception of one person and that person was Deanne. Remember, that's Donna's best friend from the hospital. Deanne was still hanging around and offering help with Bailey, but at some point, her support became a little too pushy, according to Rebecca. She insisted on being a part of Bailey's life nearly to the point of trying to replace Donna, according to Rebecca. She didn't feel comfortable with it. When I heard Rebecca say that, I felt like, okay, you're one to talk because here you are, you taking care of this baby that wasn't yours that um, Donna had adopted. But I do believe that Rebecca from the very onset had good intentions, despite whatever we may talk about. So Rebecca mentioned her concerns about Deanne to Mark. He brushed it off saying that she was just trying to be a part of the baby's life and a part of things because Donna was her best friend and the baby is a connection to Donna. So Rebecca and Mark ended up spending a lot of time with each other. 
Um, at night after the baby was put to sleep, they'd be up, they'd be drinking, things of that nature. And just a few months after her death, Mark calls up Donna's family to let them know that Rebecca is pregnant. Extremely inconsiderate if you ask me, especially because they're still dealing with the loss of their daughter, number one. Number two, you're calling them to announce that you're having a baby knowing the struggles that their daughter had in order of conceiving with you, but you want to announce this to them. Mark was thrilled. And despite being Jewish, he began to attend church with Rebecca, who was a Christian. He told her that they could raise uh, the child as Christian, that he would be willing to switch his faith, that he wanted to marry her. When their rabbi, Michael, found out, he was shocked. And he asked Mark how he could give up his entire life of Judaism just to sit here and become, you know, a Christian to be with this woman. And according to the rabbi, Mark replied, Judaism is just too difficult and unforgiving. As a result of that statement, he was confused at why Mark needed forgiveness in the first place. But none of that really mattered because even though Rebecca said that she was hesitant, he told her that this is what Donna would want. And in October of 1996, he got married to Rebecca, telling no one. Donna's family was crushed when they ended up finding out. It bothered them that Donna could so easily be replaced in Mark's life after 14 months of her being gone. Mark had moved on with his life. He sold his previous house in December. He and Rebecca moved into a new home with more land. And over the next three years, they would have three children of their own. As a result, they began to pull away from Donna's family, which hurt them immensely. When Sarah would go to see her granddaughter, she often would cry, you know, reminded that her daughter was not there to watch her baby grow up, a baby that her daughter so desperately wanted. And this bothered Mark. He didn't want her crying around Bailey. So at one point, Sarah, you know, being a grandma, trying to give her granddaughter something, gave her a necklace, you know, in remembrance of Donna. And Mark asked her to take it off, saying that it made him feel bad. I'm just showing you some of the things that was going on. And things just got worse. Like every time she was made to feel more uncomfortable when she made visits, she said that they stopped getting along. And then she finally received a letter from Mark stating that Bailey would no longer be calling her grandma, which broke her heart. She wrote back pleading with him to reconsider, but he insisted that the decision was made. Bailey would not be calling her grandma. And it took some time, but Sarah Jane did realize that, you know what, I'm being shut out and there's really nothing I can do about it. And even though I can't be a part of Bailey's life, what I'm going to do is I'm going to still care about her. I'm going to send her a card every year on her birthday just to let her know that I care. So Donna was murdered and her family was no longer a part of that. Mark submitted a claim against her life insurance policy, collected $150,000, and he also applied for assistance from the Crime Victims Compensation Act and received the maximum of $25,000, but that wasn't enough. He felt that BART Transportation should pay for their negligence in hiring uh, a homicidal driver exactly four months after Donna's murder, Mark filed a multi-million dollar wrongful death civil lawsuit against Bart Transportation and the Robert Harrington estate. I keep, I keep going between calling him Roger and Robert. I hope I'm calling this man the right name. I'm gonna just call him Harrington, the Harrington estate. He claimed that Bart should have known that he, Harrington was dangerous and unfit for the job. This decision, along with some of his other choices, brought some things to light. So one, af one month after Mark filed the lawsuit against Bart, that's five months since his wife has been murdered, the detectives received a visit from him. It struck them as odd since you never don't, you know, normally... People don't come to visit after a case is closed, but Mark claimed that he wanted to see if he could get his gun back from evidence. I personally think it's weird, but he wanted it. They let him know that they have no problem giving him back the gun. And then Mark asked him how the case, you know, that is closed is going. It's closed. After 48 hours, they closed it. 
They determined he did nothing wrong. So why would you want to know that? Detective Cox, Charlie, the one who also felt like, you know, Harrington had to be guilty, was like, wait a second here. It's kind of odd that of all things, that's what he's wondering. So that kind of, you know, piqued his interest. It further piqued his interest when he came back another time, letting detectives know that he was going to be remarried. So Doug Williamson, the other lead detective on the case, had always had suspicions from day one about the murder, but he was overruled by the higher ups who insisted that the case needed to be closed. It makes me wonder how many times a ball has been dropped because of the higher ups, because they said it wasn't enough. So Detective Cox and Detective Williams now both want the case reopened, but they know that their bosses won't allow it. They need solid evidence. So Mark's life gets to go on. He gets to have his new wife. He gets to have his beautiful children. He even gets a promotion, leaving all his past affiliations basically floating in the wind. Things weren't go, were, Things were going great until Bart decided to fight back. The company's attorneys launched their own investigation and it took years. They worked closely with police sharing the cost for forensic ex um, experts. Just over three years after the murders, Rebecca took Mark to the ER when he wasn't feeling well. They're at the ER. Guess who they ran into? They ran into Deanne, Donna's best friend. So they're in the waiting room and Deanne is staring. She's staring them down. She's glaring at them because they're together. It's evident that they're together. There's, she's staring so hard that as they're leaving, Mark ends up telling Rebecca that they're probably gonna hear something from her because of how she was looking at them. After all, Rebecca felt like Donna in the beginning, not Donna, Deanne in the beginning was imposing too much and she was jealous of her so she could understand like, yeah, we're probably gonna hear from her, but they didn't. What Deanne decided to do was that she, you know, she couldn't take it anymore. For the past several years, she had been struggling with severe depression and other mental issues brought on by her guilt about knowing the truth about the murders. So after seeing them in the ER, she decides that she needs to talk to police. And in February of 1999, she confesses to police that she knew something about Donna's murder. In exchange for immunity, she tells them that she had been having an affair with Mark her supposed best friend. And it continued for six months. Deanne claimed that they were in love and Mark at one point had even gotten them wedding rings, but said that they just needed to divorce their spouses. Mark told her it would be easier if Donna was dead for them to be together. Told her that all she would have to do is all he would have to do, I'm sorry, is, oh no, she, all she, I'm all over the place, sorry y'all, all she would have to do was find the body while he was out of town. So she told Mark, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And throughout that time, he kept mentioning Donna dying. It made her uncomfortable. Mark also told her that if she told anyone about the murders, that their, you know, their gooses would be cooked. I personally feel like she's a crappy friend because she knew all along that this man had something to do with these murders. And rather than her just saying it, she allowed for him to not only get away with one, but two murders, making Mark kill her best friend. And he kills the best friend. Well, let me not say making, knowing he killed the best friend and he kills the best friend. And you don't do anything. You don't say anything for over three years about the situation. And the only time you decide to say something about the situation is because you realize that he picked another woman over you because that's what he did. And the only reason why I think she said anything is because he moved on. So as far as I can tell, and in my eyes, she's not sugar, honey, iced tea either. So the two detectives were surprised because they interviewed her before on the day of the murders and she said none of this. So they did some searching. They checked the hotel records where she claimed they stayed. They also checked phone records and found out that the two of them had over 845 minutes of phone conversation, meaning she was telling the truth. A month before the murders, 
She confided in Donna that she was having problems with her marriage, that she was considering getting back with an ex and moving to Minnesota. Donna didn't want her to do that. And being a good friend, she tried to help her with her marital problems. So she thought, you know what? I don't know what a man thinks. Let me get a, a loyal, reliable man to give his perspective and help. And what better man to talk to her best friend than her husband? So she asked Mark if he'd be willing to talk with her. He agrees, right? They meet. I don't know what is up with this tripod. Y'all, I'm sorry for all these bloopers and stuff, but y'all know I do not edit. It's still moving. What the world? It's like a super mover. And I'm not starting over. Not no 40 minutes into this thing. Okay. <sighs> they meet and affair begins. That night at a hotel, they sleep with each other. They then start talking to each other two to three times a day. They're meeting up at hotels to do things. They're going to cars to do things. They're even at some point doing things in each other's homes when their spouses aren't around. And the sad thing is they're doing all of this. She's thinking she's helping her friend and the spouses have no clue of what's really going on. These people continue to go out and hang out with their significant others, acting like nothing is going on with them, even though they both knew that they're cheating on their husband and wife. Which makes me further know, Donna didn't see any of this coming on the day of her attack. A friend recalled how after Donna's death, Mark told her that he missed having a physical relationship and needed a woman's touch. The friend considered it a pass at her and she became uncomfortable. So all of this stuff is coming out as they're continuing to search for things. And Mark has this lawsuit against Bart Transportation. Around that time that she, Deanne, was visiting police, Mark is seeking $1.5 million from BART, and they're planning on settling this lawsuit outside of court. The company was on a verge of making him an offer when they get a phone call from someone to the attorney telling them, do not settle with Mark. The attorney asks who's calling. The person on the phone doesn't say, says, I can't say, but don't settle with him. Says, I went to police. The case is going to be reopened. The attorney was all ears, but she hangs up the call. And unbeknownst to her, the law firm has a caller ID. So attorney Nolan calls back, tells her, look, you're so-and-so, name's on the caller ID. You telling us not to settle, I need to know why. She doesn't want to say so at first. He threatens to subpoena her. She agrees to come in. She comes in, gives them a 60-page sworn statement talking about the affair and everything else she knew about Mark. As a result of some of this, and at some point, Mark withdrew the civil suit. But the damage is done. Because after years of litigation, they're not about to drop this. So the detectives finally have enough to present this to, you know, the bosses to have the case reopened. Detectives went to retrieve the evidence from the case. It was missing. It had been turned over to Winger's attorneys to be used in his civil case against Bart. Dumb. I feel like it's stupid, but they were willing to search more into this stuff than the police officers were. So handing over evidence to Mark's attorneys was the first in a long list of things that they did wrong that they later had to acknowledge that they did wrong. They head to the attorney's office to retrieve the evidence and as they were about to leave, the attorney's like, do you want the three Polaroids that I also have? This is a shock to detectives because they didn't know anything about these three Polaroids. So Detective Cox didn't recall any Polaroids, but said, sure, I'll take them. Let me see. These three Polaroid photos were taken before the bodies were removed. The paramedics had arrived. The officer who was first on the scene has submitted them, but no one actually looked at them. Make it make sense. What kind of crap job are they doing 
that they don't even look at the photos or the actual evidence. And after two days, y'all say he's not guilty. These three photos turn out to be the most impactful pieces of evidence in the case because they show the position of Roger's body, the position that his body was facing, and that it was in the same direction as Donna's. Despite Mark explaining that when he shot Roger, that Roger was kneeling down next to Donna's head. As he was beating her, he said he shot him and that he fell backwards. His feet stayed near Donna's head, but the Polaroids show the exact opposite. And the blood spattered experts agree because they did not find any cast off on Roger that would explain what he said he saw. The pictures were undeniable proof that Mark was not telling the truth, which as a result made them dig deeper. So they look at the different types of, of evidence and all of a sudden, even though the same evidence was in their face many years ago, this makes them question things because they see Roger's coffee mug and the cigarettes were on the kitchen table. As I said earlier, why would he bring that? If he was going to do something, he had two weapons in his car, a knife and a tire iron. If he planned to murder Donna, I would think he would bring those things in. Roger's car also had a note. On top of that, Mark said he held Donna. You heard him crying in the, 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 the 911 call. I just got to hold her. I just got to hold my wife. Da, 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 da. But if you held her, then she wouldn't be face down. And you also would have had blood because there was blood all over her, all over you. Basically, nothing that he described lined up with forensics. Findings from the blood spatter on Mark's shirt, the guns and spent shell casings that were not discharged where he claimed he had shot Roger, none of it was consistent with his findings. And then there's a 911 call. When police arrived at the scene, Mark told them that he shot Roger twice, a few seconds apart, but at that time he had made the first 911 call, and as I said multiple times, a single shot was fired. Before he hangs up on the call, he says he's making sounds. It's Roger moaning. He even tells the 911 operator, the guy's making noises. I got to get to my baby because she's crying. Hangs up, but when the operator calls him back, there is no more moaning. Paramedics arrive, and there were two bullets in Roger Harrington's head. Mark's version keeps changing. At one point, uh, he told Donna's um, father the story and he's like while he's telling me the story after the funeral he doesn't even sound like a grieving widower that I'm crying and he wasn't that he never shed a tear about what happened during the murder even though his father-in-law is sitting there crying as he's recapping the story Rebecca's brother also stated that there was something odd about him because as he told his story, he was more concerned about making sure that his her brother knew he was the hero rather than grieving about his wife being killed. Donna's friends and family even wondered why the front door was unlocked that afternoon because Donna always kept her doors locked. And according to Donna's father, one of Donna's sisters and friends even tested out Mark's account of the events that night one of them ran on the treadmill, the other one fell on the floor, and the person that was in the basement couldn't hear anything because the treadmill was too loud. So in December 1999, as both Bart and the police investigators were well under their investigation, Springfield's no local newspaper ran an article and it stated that the claims that Bart, uh, it stated the claims that Bart made against um, Mark, based on the findings of the blood splatter expert, that Mark basically orchestrated the murder of Roger and that Mark had killed both his wife and Roger. Rebecca couldn't believe that they were doing this and that law enforcement and Bart got it wrong and she felt like they were wrongly to in, you know, targeting her husband and she thought that over time the investigation would clear them. And she, as well as, you know, him, were 
going to be okay. But that's not what happened. Let me talk to about Roger for a second. Roger was optimistic about his future. He was proud of his new job with Bart and he loved the van that he drove. <sighs> that ride that he had that day, the conversation that he had with Mark's wife gave Mark an opportunity to destroy so many li lives because the shuttle ride fell right into Mark's lap. He turned Roger into a casualty of war and a scapegoat. As soon as he heard of the incident, he insisted that Donna fully document every detail because this helped his plan. So two days after the ride, Mark asked his co-worker, Candace Bolden, what would happen to their baby if Donna died before the adoption process was complete? Three days after the shuttle ride, he told Deanne, I need you to get that guy in my house. I need to get him there. That same day, he called the owner of Bart to complain about the driver and he spoke with the owner whose name was Duffy and asked for Roger's last name saying he wanted to talk to him directly but the owner refused and said that they don't give out that information the only way he'd be willing to do that is if it was okay with the driver so the owner contacts him saying that Mark would like to speak to you and Roger was eager to talk to him to work things out and gave the um owner of Bart permission to give his phone number to him. So on the day of the murder, Mark makes a call to Roger Harrington. Roger's roommate was there. He received the call, heard it, and he said it was very clear that Mark called Roger that morning to invite him to his house, not to warn him to stay away from his wife. So he plotted on this man from the moment that he got that information. His roommate says, along with another friend, that Mark called and Roger was eager to work things out because he thought he would get his job back. So he, at about 3.30, according to the um, crime scene analysis, blood spatter experts feel like he arrived. They said he left out at about 3.30. Once Harrington arrived and he was inside the home, that Mark likely forced him to his knees, shot him in the back of his head. Hearing the shots, Donna came out, came rushing into the room, and Mark beat her to death with the hammer. Reports say that he hit her at least seven times. And it just makes me sick thinking about her last moments. Knowing that her husband attacked her, Donna probably even heard him on the phone with 911, faking distress as she laid there lifeless. Lying and acting like someone else did it. Not being able to say anything. So he calls 911, midway through, he hangs up. They think that he came up with an excuse because Roger was still alive and he shot him again. Neighbors even say that they heard a shot and then five minutes later, they heard another shot, which goes with what forensics found. These are all things that the police could have found early on had they actually done an investigation. So police reclassify the killings as a staged domestic homicide and that Roger Harrington was not a murderer, but a victim. He was lured into the home and killed and framed. That way, Mark could kill his wife. So on August 23rd, 2001, Mark Winger was arrested at his job. He was charged with two counts of first degree murder and held on a $10 million bail. Mark asked a childhood friend to help him post bail. That friend refused. His, his arrest vindicated Roger Harrington, but did it really because they buried that man for a long time in the news to the point where Charlie um, Cox, one of the detectives, the one who said that he knew Roger, ended up apologizing for his part in them not seeking out things better. Roger's innocence was no surprise to his family. They never thought that he was a murderer. Even when the case, case was closed, his mother insisted that despite his mental illness, he was not a violent person. And I think that that was another piece that was left out. 
According to his sister Barbara, he was the kindest soul that you ever meet. If she needed a gallon of milk in the middle of the night, that he would go get it for her. She even talked about how the last time she saw him, that he came by to pick up some baby clothes for a friend that needed some but didn't have any money to get any. She said that that domestic altercation that Detective Cox talked about, that he didn't tell the whole story and he wasn't listening to the whole story because what happened is Roger was in a rocky marriage and he came home one day to find his wife and her ex-husband throwing his belongings out of their home. He got upset as anyone would whose stuff was being tossed out and got into it with the ex-husband. The wife tried to get in the middle of it and that's when the detective Cox showed up. They say that they tried to let him know. Even another lady by the name of Trisha Ray, whose mother owned another trailer, Roger rented, tried to convince the police that Roger was harmless, that he was kind and he was gentle. And she said it was frustrating because no one would believe us. It goes back to that bias that I was talking about of how just because this person who you see, who you deem is this as poor you automatically think negative things with him and it doesn't even have to be anything that is done intentionally which makes it implicit i know that the police she says i know what the police were thinking here's this man with a good name and a good job living in a nice house meanwhile they thought that we were trailer trash and roger was crazy despite his run-ins with the law court hospital records showed that roger was just depressed he was also delusional, but he didn't pose a threat to anyone. And I don't understand why for all those years that wasn't mentioned. As March trial began, police acknowledged that they made a lot of mistakes as they should have. During the first investigation, including they threw out, they threw out blood evidence, returning the man's gun to him and turning over crime scene photos, the hammer and other evidence to Mark's attorney crazy right but you want to get praised because you apologize for your mistakes meanwhile your mistakes could have ended someone else's life right because the second investigation was solid the prosecution set out to prove that mark plotted and carried out a murder luring roger harrington to his home shooting him beating his wife to death then framing roger for the murder rebecca thought right up till the end that the 12 jurors would find her husband not guilty. And after three weeks of testimony and 13 hours of deliberation on May 29th, 2002, six and a half years after Donna and Roger were murdered, a jury found Mark Wet, uh, Winger guilty of two counts of first degree murder. One of the jurors would later say that if you're gonna go over to kill someone, you don't bring a pack of cigarettes and something to drink and just hope that the murder weapon is going to be there. But jurors overall said that the state's best evidence was the first evidence that police collected, which were the three Polaroids. Mark was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And Rebecca at that time still didn't believe it. However, she now does. To honor their daughter's memory in 1988, Sarah Jane and I were her um, husband raised funds for a new hospital wing. They named it Donna's Playroom. They also created Donna's Fund for Women in Distress at a shelter in Florida to help victims leave abusive relationships, providing with, you know, funds and security that they may need. It helps them transition to new lives, making sure that they are safe and happy, which I think is a beautiful way to honor the memory of her daughter while protecting, you know, children and moms. Mark is currently serving his sentence. He filed multiple appeals at conviction, complaining about conditions of the prison and things of that nature, but he lost. Then in 2006, four years after his conviction, he was indicted again because he attempted to hire a prisoner by the name of Terry Humble to murder two people. Deanne, the one that was supposedly Donna's best friend and his childhood friend, uh, Jeffrey, that wouldn't bail him out. He was found guilty, got another 35 years on top of his life without parole sentence. He appealed it, lost it again. He's filed another appeal as uh, recently as 2023. Mark and Donna's daughter, Bailey, is being raised by Rebecca with the rest of her siblings. Rebecca did divorce Mark, had her children's name legally changed from his name to her maiden name, and 
felt like it was a step to, you know, getting rid of who she was. And now as a result, she is no longer with him. The home that they had was foreclosed. She ended up um, moving in with her brother because she had been a stay-at-home mom for seven years, filed for bankruptcy, is with her brother making a new life for herself. She now um, talks about being the wife of an incarcerated murderer. I don't quite get why she does that, especially since she divorced him, but it's something that she's passionate about. She said that a lot of times people don't think about the kids that have to grow up with incarcerated parents. That part I get. And that it seems like no one thinks about them. No one thinks about the living victims. It's a humiliating and embarrassing role to play. I understand what she's trying to say as far as them being living victims, but they never ex can relate to the actual victims. Unfortunately, you got with the man who you didn't know who killed his wife. And honestly, Who's to say when he, he was done with you or you didn't do what he wanted you to do that he wouldn't have killed you too? Because there was De uh, Deanne and then there was you. Deanne was replaced by you. So you could have been replaced by someone too. Mark had, you know, was able to keep Bailey away from Donna's family. But in 2019, Rebecca uh, allowed Bailey to come back into the the life of those grandparents now donna's mom and her stepfather are an active part of bailey's life she's being raised by rebecca but she does call sarah jane and ira her grandpa donna's mother said that mark is like a chameleon and he is i can't help but think about what was done not just to donna but to roger why is it more done for people with serious mental illnesses? Why aren't all the stories taken into consideration when, con when crimes like these are co committed? If Roger and his roommate weren't living in a trailer park, if they had money, if he wasn't considered to have mental deficits, would their stories have been believed at the time of the murders? Would police have taken more than 48 hours to investigate? Yes, Detective Charlie Cox apologized for his shortcomings and his judgment of Roger, but that does not negate what happened to me. There are far too many people out there being convicted of crimes that they didn't do or in this case killed innocently. Donna's story is tragic because she was let down in so many ways. Her husband murdered her. Her best friend betrayed her. But Roger was also let down too. The fact that police didn't want to believe anybody in his life due to their personal views or even because of the supposed status of Roger all seem problematic to me. How many marks are out there? How many people have committed what could be the perfect murder? We see left and right over the years that DNA has exonerated people and do all these things. And I feel like as a society, as law enforcement, we have to do better about thinking about the underdog. That's all I have for today. Please let me know your thoughts down below. Sorry this was long. I wanted to make sure that you all understood all the different aspects of the case and see how long this stretched out. That This man almost got away with this. What would have happened if Deanne didn't see him in the hospital? She's flawed and I think that she should have got some time too because the moment that he saw, sought out to try to get rid of her friend just to be with her, she should have said something. Yeah, that's not a crime, but she knew that he wanted to commit one and she did nothing. So she said on various videos that she feels guilty about it and I think she should. You all let me know your thoughts down below. Until next time.